What's up, what's up? Flexi, Lexi, what's up? I'm waiting for my guy. Oh, hey, friend, good. How are you? I'm waiting for my guy, Arby Marcus, to jump on. Um, oh, snap, okay. Let me see. Oh, here he is. Here he is. All right, we... we Let's do it. We're about to have a great conversation, I think. I've never actually done this conversation on live before. There he is. My man. There he is. How are you, brother? Uh, you know, doing great and getting better. How are you? That's the same, man. That's the that's this interesting, beautiful part of this time is that we can hold like the deepest compassion for people who are, you know, having challenges in these times. But personally, just level up in so many different ways. It's been like you know that Bruce Lee movie, I think it was Enter the Dragon, where he's in that place where there's just mirrors everywhere. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know? And it's yeah. like there's mirrors on every aspect of our life. And I love that environment. I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, let me look at my relationship with myself and with everybody around me and who's important to me That's and it, what's man. important in my life. So You have to, man. I mean, it, I mean it, it, you know, life, life can sometimes serve you up a nice, a nice plate of reflection um, sometimes you lose your job, you lose a girlfriend, a boyfriend, sometimes there's a pandemic, but you know, it, it all has to come back to you. It's, it's for you to be still like you started mm -hmm. off the conversation. You say you can be super compassionate for people going through it. And you, you know, you have to be, because ultimately we're, we're one, we're all connected. We all take care of each other, but also if there's no peace in you, how can you give peace out there to the world? So you have to have that peace and joy and harmony already within you. That's the number one most important thing to cultivate first. Yeah. The greatest act of service is the act of being in service to yourself and like emanating that energy. That's what's going to shift mm. things around you the most is. And I think that's something that just watching what you've been putting out, you know, like you can drop into one of your videos and just the energy with which you're expressing that and the energy that which you're coming across the words are great. The words are brilliant. Like that's the craft that you have. And it's one of the crafts that I have the ability to string these words together, but it's not the words. It's mm -hmm. like the essence of the human being behind the words mm -hmm. that comes through in the subtext in a language that's translatable to all <laughs> human beings, no matter which language we're using, you know, like you could be speaking in tongues and we get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause it's like, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I feel that. You the know? energy It's the energy, bro. It's uh. You know, I tell people all the time, it's, it's where the words come from. And I say, what comes from the heart reaches the heart. You know, you can, you can teach a kid, you know, the, to, to, to recite a complex, uh, you know, quantum physics equation. But ultimately, unless they're actually coming from a place where they've, they've done the research and study and the discovery on, on, their, on the, their own, yep. it, just, it just doesn't hold that, that fragrance of authenticity mm -hmm. and that's what i try to do with my content man is, is always come from a an authentic place yeah yeah the fragrance the essence you know mm -hmm. when i was in uh i haven't got to talk to you about it but I, I spent six days in complete darkness complete isolation complete silence yeah. and in that in that moment what i really missed it wasn't the sight of things like you'd think you'd miss the sight of things because you're in absolute pitch dark but I didn't miss the sight of things. I missed the essence of things. I didn't miss the sight of people or the sound of people. I missed like the feeling of mm. those things. Like I didn't miss seeing an oak tree, but I missed like feeling an oak tree. You know, I didn't miss like talking to my friends. I miss like feeling my friends. Wow. You know what I mean? Like that's the thing you end up realizing when you strip these things away is like, what's really important? Yeah. You know, and it's far beyond what you think the senses are going to perceive of it. Like you miss huh. the thing itself huh. and its essential nature. Wow. That's beautiful. Where would you get the idea to do that? Man, I've been exploring all of these different practices for so long. And I just heard about this one. It's called Darkness mm -hmm. Retreat. And, you know, obviously, I think, have you ever done a Vipassana? Like a, a silent meditation? I haven't, man. I mean, I've done a silent I haven't meditation. Either. I haven't either. I Vipassana, though. Yeah, not the 10 days. So that's restricting one thing because you're not communicating, right? And I know, and I've 
I thought like, okay, there's virtue in that for sure. But for me, this was like, oh, this is another level because not only am I going to be silent and I'm not even going to hear any other sounds of anybody, but it's also going to be dark and it's also going to be alone. And I was like, if I'm going to go for it, I might as well fucking go for it. Wow. You know, like I might as well just see how deep that can go. And it would ended up being the most powerful experience of my life, which is not adding anything. It was actually removing things to add like to, to add the gnosis, as the Greeks would say, the understanding of myself stripped wow. from everything. Huh. So that's what kind of drew me to it. And I'm so glad I did because it, I mean, it changed the trajectory of my life. Wow. Beautiful. That's amazing. How, how long was it, you said? A week? Six full days, yeah. Six days, okay. Wow, okay. Yeah. And, and so there was no, so it was just pitch black. So there's, a, there's like organizations that set these things up. Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> cool. Because it's like a technology because they have right. like one pinprick of light. Like if you had that one little light in your room, I actually accidentally brought, I have one of my necklaces. I didn't realize I had glow in the dark beads on it. Mm. And like, so, <laughs> so it was, I was out in the sun before I went in and I'm like trying to get the last bit of sunshine. This is in Germany. I was doing this. Okay. And then I put my necklace in the cabinet. I kind of memorized where everything was. Mm. And then my cabinet is fucking glowing. And I'm like, what the mm. fuck? Am I mad? Am I hallucinating? Like, what is going on? And I had what? to figure out that my, and it was incredibly distracting just having that little bit of light. And I was like, oh shit, my necklace glows in the dark. Huh. And so I had to put my necklace <laughs> in two pairs of socks, That's you funny. know, so that I could, so that I could like have the absolute pitch dark experience. And then the way they deliver food, they deliver food in a pitch dark hallway outside your room. They ring a bell, you grab the food. So there's never any break for six days. There wasn't one little pinprick of light that I was able to see. Wow. And uh and so that was that was really wow. powerful, man. Wow. And at the end, did it just become a normal thing? Like did you did you miss seeing or was it just has it did it acclimate to your to your body so much that it was just the normal way of things? You know, it's something you, I never really got used to it, for sure, okay, never, you okay. know, but but my appreciation, I mean, and I can send you this video when we're offline and I haven't posted it and someday we'll, you know, put out a video about it. But when I, there's like an unblinding, a ceremonial unblinding process where they have these really good mm -hmm. mindfold masks, which block out all the light. Um, mm -hmm. And so they brought me downstairs in the mindfold mask and it was sunset looking out over this like pastoral landscape. And when I took my eyes off, you know, first you adjust to the light, which is hard. But then when I actually could focus and see things, I just started weeping because mm. it was not only the beauty of looking at something that I've looked at for my whole life and wow. not seen it. But yeah. it was also the recognition that I've been for 39 years or well, maybe when I was a kid, I had that awe and appreciation. But for so long, I would just take things for granted. Huh. I would try take the idea that I could see the world for granted. I could take mm. the idea that I could you know, go out and travel and walk around outside and like mm. hear birds and, and all of that. And, and the sadness and the grief of recognizing that I was never quite present enough to appreciate that fully. Mm. You know, it's just this overwhelming catharsis of emotions of like, wow. whoa. Wow. That's amazing. I love that, man. I, yeah, I always say like the, 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 the truly enlightened being can fall into a deep wonder by looking at a blade of gr of grass, you know, like yeah. simple beauties, you just you just fall in love with the mystery behind it all. You know, for me, I've never been a guy who has to go to, uh, you know, some far off location and see these beautiful sunsets. You know, stay in a luxury. I never to to simply be in this this mystery of presence. Of presidency of, of just being here like you didn't have to be here and the fact yeah. that we are here like that that the first gratitude like you can be grateful for thing for things and health and but just existence this very existence consciousness space is it's the most magnificent um state of mind state of presence that i think a human being can be in and it's always here. It's always here. Because <laughs> otherwise, you're, otherwise you're chasing constantly. And I think it was a quote from Proust, like the master doesn't go out to seek new experiences to constantly bring him to 
you know, the novelty of something that they can appreciate. Like the master can look at the same thing with fresh eyes every day, you know, like, so like you could just look at the same thing and come and be like, wow, you know, I've had this sandwich mm. every day for my, my whole life. And I love this sandwich or I love this tree or I love yeah. this, this person that I'm waking up next yeah. to and just look at it with those fresh eyes of presence, not carrying the baggage of all of our being as a as a child or as a baby opening his eyes for the first time it's it's, it's magnificent and I, I encourage everybody to come back to this state of presence because some you know we, sometimes we say knowledge is power you know i see that you, you got a lot of books behind you and i, I got a whole mm -hmm. i got a whole bunch of books but sometimes yeah. but sometimes knowledge can also be a prison because it can it can create filters from the way in which you look at the world. Like if you study trees and you get into dendrochronology and start studying this type and that type, that genus, that species, you no longer see a tree anymore. Mm -hmm. You see an idea of a tree and you can't really appreciate the essence anymore. <laughs> yep. <I> love, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you know what was funny, man, is like uh, this is kind of a funny story. It's totally a tangent, but so I did a, a psychedelic called the Boga, which comes from Gabon in Africa. And it's through this tradition of medicine people called the Bwiti people, okay. right? And so in this experience, this is the first time I was doing it, this was over 10 years ago. And I didn't really understand what was gonna happen to me physiologically. You know, I understood that it was gonna be a psychedelic journey. And in this psychedelic journey, um, the way that the medicine works, it's actually a, a stimulant medicine, which is unusual. Most of them drop you into like kind of like lower heart rate and kind of this relaxed state, but it's a stimulant. Mm -hmm. And the way that stimulants act on the body, so it just has a physiological effect. So I went to go to the bath, I went to go take a pee, like about five hours in. And I kind of, <laughs> this is an embarrassing story. So I go to take a pee. And I, and, and I, my, mind, my mind was so clear, I could like understand things in a radically new way. Huh. And I go to take a pee and I go to grab my dick to take a pee and I'm, and I whiffed and I missed. And I was like, what happened? What happened? And my dick had shriveled to the, to the density of Pluto. Like it had just contracted like <laughs> into my, into my body. And I started to panic and I was like, Oh no, what happened? And I was like, okay, okay, get it together. Like I need to make sure this thing still works. So I like grab it and I'm like, okay, think of something that would arouse you. So I can get a little blood flow into this thing. So I don't think this is healthy. So I start to think about, I start to think about, I start to think about a vagina. And I'm like, yeah, that always gets me going. Like, and I start, I thought about a vagina and then I understood it. I like understood like the function of like how the labia worked and how like the vulva worked and how like the vaginal canal and like how everything worked. And I was like, oh no, this isn't working the way I thought it was gonna work. This is not making me aroused. Like I'm understanding from a scientific perspective about everything. And it's like, Absolutely. it's exactly what you're saying. Like some part of this, just like appreciating it for what it is without going into the depth of the scientific knowledge of it. Like at, in that one moment, a boga allowed me to look at it like I would look like a scientific anatomical gynecologist would look at the thing. And I was like, oh no, that's not what I was looking for. I just wanted to appreciate this thing. You know, and uh, <laughs> I was like, it, I don't know why that came to mind, but it's just it's just one of those things where you can learn too much about something that it actually robs you of just the awe of just receiving it without even understanding it. That's it, man. That's it. I mean, it's it's you know, my parents recently uh, got a divorce, right? Mm -hmm. After like thirty something years which is common, right? That's, that might not be common, but divorce itself is, is a common thing. And I think one of the most prevalent reasons why people get divorced is because of knowledge. You mm -hmm. think you know that person, right? And when you know something, it becomes dead. It's, yeah. not, it's not alive anymore. You, you, you don't see that person that's changing and growing every day. You feel like you know them. And when you know them, you have put them in this box. And there's no, there's no escape in that, but it's the box of your own creation and your own making. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's to see your, your, to see the world with that beginner's mind, to see your partner with that curious beginner's mind, to, to just be very childlike, you know, it's, 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 it's so funny, man, how life is really this process of unlearning, right? More than it is learning. Understanding life is really about unlearning. 
so many yeah. of the things that they taught us, right? To, yeah. to, to, to polish the mirror. Ram Dass, we, we connected on Ram Dass a while ago. Mm -hmm. and he's got a book called The Polished Mirror. And it's only until we can polish our own mirrors of ideas, of concepts, of, of traumas, of all of these things, can we see ourselves clearly and we see the world clearly and the flowers and the light shining on the flowers clearly. Only when we mm -hmm. polish our own, clean our own windows. That's it. And that's what the, you know, the experience that you have when you're around a master, I've only actually, I never got to see Ram Dass in person. I wish I did, you mm -hmm. know, because the, the stories of meeting him in person, you know, gave this kind of going back to what we originally started with, like the essence of him was something that was really special that people got to witness. And for me, Don Miguel Ruiz was that, was that kind of the master that I was able to be in his presence for a week. Mm -hmm. And every night after we would do like talks and different things, every night he would drink one glass of wine and look out at the sunset. Mm -hmm. And the sunset was remarkably similar every different every night. You know, we were in um, in Mexico and it was very similar. And the, and the wine was just the house red wine. It was mm -hmm. the same wine that he was. But he would sip that wine and it was, I swear, like someone who had just tasted red wine for the first time in his whole life. And he would mm. look out at the sunset, and, and this is a, a man in time, and he's looking out at the sunset and just going, wow, mm. you know, at 70, mm. you know, how many sunsets has that man seen? Mm. And like that thing to me was more important than anything he said the whole week mm. was just to observe him with that kind of child's mind of like, this glass of wine is amazing. It might be the same glass of wine that I've had every day. It might be the same sunset, mm -hmm. but you know, that's I think where we're all headed is to this just simple presence and all of these different spiritual paths. You know, we've connected on a lot of different books from different masters. Mm -hmm. They're all pointing to the same thing. It's just like, be here now, the power of now, like mm -hmm. presence, like what can, you, what can you get from this one moment? Mm -hmm. You know, discarding all of your, past and all of the future thoughts about it. That's it, man. What advice would you give to somebody, maybe somebody listening here on um, how do they get into that this, this present state of awareness amidst the noise of people around them, of TV, of the news, of social media? Would you tell them to go into go to Germany and do a dark room meditate? Like, what would you say? I mean, that's helpful. That's helpful, but it doesn't, it doesn't stick. It's just like, it's something that you can use as a lever. Like you use that as a lever to pry you into that state for a little while. You know, like even a near death experience that someone could have can make you appreciate life, you know, in a different way. And sometimes it'll last for a while. Mm. And, but I think it has to, you have to develop it as a practice. And I think, so it's good to use these tools to like, okay, now I see. And so that you can remember, but you gotta like practice makes the master in everything. Mm. So how do you like practice presence? Well, I think a lot of it is a choice. Like, can you clear your mind? And I think that's why meditation is so important. Like clear all your thoughts, clear everything that you have and get to that place of just experience, just mm -hmm. witness, pure witness as consciousness, <laughs> not as, you know, not as Aubrey, you know, which has a whole history and a whole identity, but just <laughs> as the universal witness, the loving witness, you know, that's why Ram Dass calls it loving awareness. Like, I am loving awareness. That was his mantra. Like, he's not Ram Dass. He's just loving awareness. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, you can practice that mm -hmm. and then just allow yourself to engage and indulge in that. Mm -hmm. and, and it also reminds me of another thing that um, uh, another Zen Buddhist monk taught me as well. My pod podcast named Shin Zen Young. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what in all of your you know, study, like, what is your advice for people to be happy, you know? And he goes, well, it's quite simple, actually. He said, smile, yeah, and then see how far that smile goes. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, he's like, just smile. Just look at that tree, be present, smile, and just see how far you can go with it. Mm. And use that as like a practice, mm. like, like, mm. like reps in the gym. You know? <laughs> Wow. Wow. I love that. Yeah, man. I that, man. Dude, I gotta, I gotta say, man, that you were, you know, one of the first people that I saw really put out a, a great, you know, piece about the virus of fear that we're dealing with simultaneously with the virus of, you know, COVID-19. 
and so well done in that video but i think so like so important to recognize that we're not dealing with one virus here we're dealing with a systemic ubiquitous virus called fear as well you know and you also put out another great like pragmatic advice about how to support the immune system which is a great way to reorient to it but but just acknowledging like we got to acknowledge the spectrum here we can't just focus on one thing and ignore the fact that we're just fucking having fear just infect our system yeah it, fear is found where mostly in the mind right it's just a, it's a it's a perception right it's and how do we change that perception we have the power to change that you know uh there's a great story see if i remember it correctly there's a um there's a man, he walks into a full elevator, <clears throat> crowded. He's in the back. No, he's, no, he's, <laughs> he, he walks in last to a full elevator and he put, he pushes his floor. And as he's standing there waiting as the, for the elevator to go up, he keeps getting poked in his back and he can't turn around because the, the, the room is so full. He, he's like, oh, he keeps fucking poking me. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, okay. When I get out of this elevator, I'm going to give this person a piece of my mind. He's so angry. <laughs> so he gets out in rage, right? He's ready. He's all ready. He gets out and he turns around and he sees it's a blind woman with a cane. Right? And immediately his, his anger turns into compassion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and why? because of a perspective change, right? Mm -hmm. The situation changed, but really it was his perspective. He was always in control. We, we live our lives and we often think that we are, um, what is it, thermostats, right? Instead of thermometers, right? Or, or, or thermometers instead of thermostats, right? We have to be in control of the temperature that when we walk into a room, instead of allowing the temperature to control us, it's so important perspective. And when, when, when we get situations like this, the world is going crazy. We have to always remember it comes back to us, right? And fear yeah. is, is, is inside of us, right? It's, it's, and we have to start with us. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, you know, fear is, is, is a survival mechanism that's, that's helped us for hundred, millions of years, you know? Some say billions of years, right? Evolutionarily speaking. It exists in all species, right? This this survival instinct. Um, but now we're at a, we're at a level where I think our frontal lobes have developed to a place where now we can step back and look at the fear and not a, and question it and not not allow it to overwhelm us. This is this is a this is true strength to be mm -hmm. able to step back and go into that witness space that you said that witness consciousness. And ask yourself, okay, am I am I watching too much TV these days? Am I scrolling down my news feed these days and feeding myself all of this energy of of, of, of hatred, of of blame, of uh, you know Trump, of fear? Am I feeding because this is food? Yeah, right. We're taking it in through here and through here. It's, it's all food. So I think it's it's so important for us to stop, to pause, to put good things into our bodies into our minds and realize when it comes to perspective and it comes to emotion, we are in control. We are in control yep. of how we want to see the world. That's the first thing I want to tell people is, is you have that power of perspective and it's the greatest power there is. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, it's almost like in the, in the natural state where fear developed, it had a very like reasonable function because what we talk about with knowledge, how knowledge isn't always helpful. Like before they even had germ theory or before they had any of these other things, like you weren't constantly worried about some, some particular thing. Like you were worried about something when shit happened. Oh, there's a wolf. Okay. We got to handle this wolf. You know, like this is a problem. You know, it might eat, it might eat something that we, that we like a person or a place or like, this is an issue, you know? And then at that point, fear is helpful because it'll scuttle all that cortisol into our body and we'll be ready to run or we'll be ready to fight or we'll be ready for that. But, you know, there wasn't this ever present, you know, kind of ever present indoctrination where everywhere we looked, there was fear at every corner and lurking on every door handle and lurking in every and everything. I mean, we're in houses. Most of us are in houses. And I know this is something that even I've engaged in, like I'm in my own house. 
Nobody's gotten coronavirus in my own house. But how many more times am I washing my hands in my own house? Like somehow, somehow, like in some way, even though I'm not even watching the news, like fear got to me in a different way where I'm like a little bit more afraid of my own refrigerator door handle. You know, like, and that's, it's something that like, because of our knowledge of this, it's created this subtle fear. And that subtle fear is going to then put all that cortisol into our body, which is good for something short term, but terrible for our immune system long term. That's it, man. That's it. And that's why I put out that video, man, is because um, fear, fear, that cortisol, it drops our immune system. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so there's, there's, there are also things that I'm not really hearing mainstream media talk about that we can do to boost our, to raise, to make it strong, right? A lot yeah. of the simple things, right? No blue light after a certain time, getting your sleep, drinking, staying hydrated, getting the certain nutrients into your body, not exercising mm -hmm. strenuously, but moderately. Like these simple things that we can do to get our immune systems back to where they're supposed to be because most people, unfortunately, especially where, you know, we're from in America, uh, we're, we're extremely obese, we're extremely sick. And you know it's funny. It's well, it's not funny. It's actually sad. I was just watching something on uh, CNN yesterday about how COVID is is affecting the black community more than any other community. Like like there are certain states where you know African Americans are like twenty five percent of the population, but there's seventy five percent of the the deaths in the and there's so many reasons about that, which we don't have to get into. But one of the main reasons is because it's an epidemic put on top of another epidemic of diabetes, of heart disease, of yeah. bad food, like all of these things. And I think the smartest thing we can do right now is to, to, to be, in, be with our families, to be still, to be present, and to take care of our health, to take care of our bodies, you know, to come back to baseline. Yeah. And people underestimate the importance of taking care of the body for so many different things. I mean, one of the studies that I looked, did some research on was the study of what happens when you change the diet and the vitamin profile. Like if you give a multivitamin and healthy food to people who've been to juvenile hall, right? So like, ju like people who've been to juvie and like mm -hmm. committed crimes, like the recidivism rate, the amount of people that go back the percentage. Mm. So they'd split them up in two in a, in a randomized trial, split them up in two. And then after certain group got out, they gave them multivitamins and they helped support their diet. Mm. And then the other people, they let just go back to their normal, their mm. normal diets, which were starved of nutrition, you know, Wonder Bread and whatever else. Mm -hmm. And the ratio of people who went back into the same kind of antisocial behavior you know, because they weren't getting the right nutrition was dramatically higher, mm -hmm. right? So things like even like being a criminal, you know, like that choice may have a lot more to do with like how we're supporting our bodies as well. Absolutely. I mean, have you have you ever been hangry? I'm sure everybody. Yeah. We've been hangry, right? <laughs> we see how food or lack of food can affect our thinking, right? We're yeah. angry. We're like, no, get away from me. I don't. It, 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 it makes a difference. The body and the mind are one. That's the thing. In this Western mm -hmm. world, we've separated it, right? Body, mind, but there's not, it's, it's all one holistic system that has to be preached. It's the truth. Like, Dr. Dr. Amen has some studies on the brains. He, he studied the brains or he referenced the study, this other study of where they looked at the brains of certain criminals and you could see certain areas of trauma that are actually in, physically, morphologically in the body, right? Mm -hmm. You study the chemical profile of certain certain people who are criminals, and you see they have lower zinc levels. There's a book from um, Julia Ross called The Mood Cure. talks all about this. So absolutely, nutritional therapy is huge. We got to take care of ourselves because it's not separate. The mind, the body are one. Yeah, that's it, man. That's so important. To, it's so important to remember that. And and I think also in this in this time where, you know, the media is just pointing at this one thing like we also got to look at what the other effects of this pandemic are like my sister who works with adoptive children and works in like child care and child welfare services mm -hmm. she's she told me something that just broke my heart man she said that child abuse related deaths mortality is up 400 mm -hmm. percent because of this because of this isolation right mm -hmm. so 
And, but that's, everybody's just so focused on like, okay, we got to make sure we flatten the curve, flatten the curve, flatten, you know, like, but, but in some way we're trading some deaths for other deaths. Mm. And I think this holistic perspective of not only our own bodies, how do Mm. we support our own bodies, but how do we support like the culture at large so that we're not just saying, okay, we're only going to think about this one thing. It's this kind of Western medicine symptom mentality, but we're going to focus everything on this one thing to the complete you know ignorance of all other aspects well there's some other gnarly shit that's happening you know so we need to be mindful of and and hopefully like you know we can all be a part of that because i don't think politicians tend to lead i think people lead and politicians respond so as we become aware of that and be like all right all right like next time you know this next virus or whatever virus comes like let's look at this more holistically like how do we support our bodies but how do we support the society at large? How do we make sure that we're not forcing people to be at home with their abusers and forcing mm-hmm. people to like, to really look at this thing from multiple different lenses so that we can do the most good, not mm-hmm. just get so fear locked and that kind of like in this kind of panic porn mentality where we're just binging on this one thing to the, you know, to the ignorance of everything else. Mm-hmm. Man, yeah, you got me at a loss for words, man. That's so, that's, wow. I mean, that 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 wasn't something I thought about, but it's so true, man, to look at the full picture. I'm sure domestic violence rates have gone up. Way up, man, tragically so. Yeah. So many issues, man, so many issues, so many symptoms. Um, what's the root, though? How can we get to, what's the root, man? What's the, how do we... How do we create something, do something, offer a, a, a platform or a, a space to get to the root of these issues? Or what is the root? What do you think the root is of, of uh, these these human issues, right? Childhood, I mean, I think, educa- is it childhood education? Is it, it's, it's all of these things, but what's the... I think the root is, I think the root is awareness. The root is awareness that we're worthy of love no matter what. You know, because I think hurt people hurt people, you know, ultimately. And then if you're also scared and in danger, that's the way that you're going to look at your neighbor and you're going to think of them as completely different than you because you're worried they're out there to take your thing or they're going to get you sick or they're going to, you know, we have this idea of separation. Um, So I think it's just raising the awareness that we're all from the same substrate, like different facets of the same diamond and that diamond's name is love. And we're all part of that. And And I think if we can really love ourselves, we'll be able to love each other, love our neighbors. And then all of this other shit, races and borders and religions and all this stuff we're fighting and grappling about and like, fuck it. You know, like that, none of that matters. We're all team people, Mm. you know, but I think that comes from like a level of consciousness that, you know, that's what I'm dedicating my life to. And I think in, in many ways, what you've been dedicating your life to is just shifting consciousness, which I think is the wellspring. I think it's the most up upstream thing that we can tackle is just this like understanding because that's going to lead people to be generous and lead people to be charitable and magnanimous and help each other out um and i think that's where we got to go so that we can not look at people as like oh that's that person they deserve it like oh can i help you know like Mm. how can i help and Mm. what's the best way i can help yeah i agree i agree i think a lot of our um solutions have been problematic in and of themselves yeah. historically uh i believe it is ram das he said it's it's foolish like like trying to relieve an itch by scratching the outside of the shoe <laughs> we got to get in there we got to get in, in in here in here in, yeah in all of our all of our problems is it's, it's, it's human issues it's consciousness right to be able to identify as consciousness not already not prince not black not what not but as consciousness first, mm-hmm. that's what they, they all mean when they say we are one, because yeah. we are one, right? We say human being, right? Mm-hmm. We're being, we're being, this beingness that already is present, beingness, presenceness, it's already here. There's a great story I want to leave you with, man. It's, it's, um, it's about a guy, he's hammering a nail into his wall, right? He's hammering his nail. And his right hand is holding the hammer. His left is holding the nail. And he hits his hand with the hammer, his left hand with the hammer, right? And he's bleeding. Now, how silly would it be for the left hand 
to say, I want justice. Give me that hammer. <laughs> That's not what happens, is it? Yeah. The right hand immediately goes to comfort, to heal the left. Why? Because it realizes that it is part of one body. And once yeah. we realize that we are part of one consciousness, non-separate, non-separation. <laughs> yeah, that's it, man. And, and Ramdas, you know, that reminds me of something Ramdas says, there's two ways that you get to that unified consciousness. And there's one that says, Tatwamasi, I am that too. Mm. And then the other one is Neti Neti, which is, I am not that. You know, so either way, either you say like, oh, I am not just Aubrey. I am not just this person of this class of this thing. Or you say, I am that, you know, mm. like I am that too. Either way, it's either radical inclusion or a radical <laughs> denial of your separateness. But either way, you're going to the get same, to the same thing, which is that you're, <laughs> you're the same thing. You're either everything or you're nothing. But wow. either way, if you're everything or you're nothing, you're back at the zero point and you're back at unicity. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, man. What's next for you, bro? What's, what's, the, what's on top? I'm writing a book, man. So, right. you know, that I'm writing a book and just still putting out podcasts and, and doing my thing. Uh, Step down as CEO of my company, which has been, um, which has been great, actually, because I got a great team and they're doing a great job. And it was actually cool. I mean, it happened like a month before all of this pandemic, but mm -hmm. what better time for a leader to prove his mettle than to help lead a company like on it through challenging times. So I'm just mm -hmm. grateful that, uh, that this happened when it did and, and that he's been able to rise up and be, you know, excellent kind of forged in the pressure of resistance beautiful. and do that. So, um, yeah, man, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a beautiful time. Like everything is, everything seems to be flowering. Um, yeah and unfolding as it should yeah that's it man beautiful no bro. beautiful well i can't wait to man i can't wait to podcast with you and hang out and, and yeah. all this ends we gotta we gotta continue these conversations it's always a pleasure man we will inshallah inshallah all yeah. right bro much love man all right brother much love to you too good chat right. thanks for everybody for tuning in thanks guys appreciate it peace